Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come, and sometimes unofficial things, which is what we're talking about <laughs> today. <laughs> I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and a writer on music for The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and various other publications. And I'm joined by my two esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hey, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, who we like to call the world's only full-time Beatles reporter. You can read his work in Billboard.com, Axis.com, that's AXS.com, and in Variety and Goldmine, and he's adding new publications mm. all the time. Hello, Steve. Hey, uh, Alan. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so today's topic is going to be one of my favorite topics, um, bootlegs, and um, we've each chosen five of them theoretically. <laughs> we probably will mention some others, and we are trying to mix group and solo so that the whole field is covered. But before we get to that, we have some news items. Um, mostly to do with the Harrison family. So, Steve? Well, tonight in Los Angeles, Danny uh, Harrison is playing a, his uh, first solo gig at the Echo, which is, uh, I understand, sold out. But also, today is the 20th anniversary of the John Fuglesang VH1 George Harrison Ravi Shankar performance, which, I mean, anybody who saw that, that's a hard one to forget. It was a beautiful you know that was fantastic, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I'm 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 astonished that it's 20 years ago, now, on this day on the date that we're taping the July 24th. So, okay. wow, and that that was that broadcast launched more than a few bootlegs itself, actually. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Our first hearing of any road, so mm -hmm. yeah. that's true. That's right. That's right. Right. And uh, in fact, I had just read that John Fuglesang said that originally it was just going to be like maybe 10, 15 minutes of an interview mm -hmm. uh, to promote Ravi Shankar's album. But they didn't expect it to be what it became. And, um, you know, the questions were really, I guess, supposed to revolve around the Ravi Shankar album, Chance of India. But they had George there. And so one thing led to another. Uh, I just uh, I had seen from this quote from from John Fuglesang that they were kind of whispering into his ear, ask him questions about John Lennon. <laughs> and and John Fuglesang thought, well, you know, George, when we talk about the Beatles so much, he wanted to get him to talk about God and spirituality and the things that George loves to talk about, which he did. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, really a wonderful interview for something that wasn't fully planned. Yeah, the way it was pulled off was kind of miraculous, mm -hmm. and yeah, the fact that we got any road, an earlier version of it, although we didn't know at the time, and he also did uh, all things must pass. Mm -hmm. I'm trying right. to remember what John Fuglesang said to him. He said, "You know, play anything, play ABBA." <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I think he said something to that effect. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a great interview. Yeah, it was a good show. It should come out on disc. Work stream or whatever they they have these days you know it should be out officially i i, I wish they could arrange that somehow but um, right right i have a feeling if they could have they would have by now but you never know right. okay and we talked about danny's uh danny one of danny's tracks is actually out there as a teaser that's right um either of you want to talk about that yeah the name of the song is called All About Waiting. Mm -hmm. It's about five minutes long. It's got a very strong electronic feel to it. Very catchy, very commercial to me, uh, very repetitious with the chorus. And I love the sound of Danny's voice, especially. Mm -hmm. I, think it has, I think it has potential if it gets airplay. Yeah. Yeah, you I mean, it, he, you think it'll get airplay? There's no way to predict that. But judging how the, the Beatles' sons are treated on the radio, no. <laughs> yeah. Just to be realistic about it, you know, I mean, I think that James McCartney's last album, you know, had some real worthwhile material on it. In fact, a lot of his stuff deserves it. 
I think a lot of what Julian's put out and Sean's put out deserves some airplay. It de- it definitely would fit, you know, the modern rock format, but radio really hasn't been that receptive to any of them. Hmm. Not since would, the days of Julian in his early years. Right. I would right. think, though, that, that if any of them had potential to get airplay, it would be Danny. I would have thought would... the Claypool Lennon Delirium, I would have thought, should have got some, given that it's not just Sean. It's, you know, there's... Well, it's Claypool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I did see one particular chart where it was listed, but I didn't see it in Billboard. And I do look at Billboard when these releases come out, and I didn't see it there. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a few modern rock stations that I listened to, and I didn't hear it on those. I don't know if it's fair to judge on just a couple of radio stations, but I don't think it got a lot of airplay. Yeah. Um, Danny's track has, you know, that that electronic um, drum going on for a a lot of it, not all of it. It it sort of disappears by the end. Um, I think on one hand might get it some airplay because it sounds very contemporary. On the other hand, I can see his dad up there wagging his finger at him because this is the, <laughs> the kind of sound that I think he was talking about in like, you know, when he, when he, he's always talking about MIDI and drum machines and all that as being, um, you know, something that wasn't for him. Um, so on one hand it's, it's, you know, it's, it's great that Danny influenced as, as he is by his father's music, which you can hear in this song, um, nevertheless is doing what he wants to do. You know, regardless of his, he's not following his father's rules necessarily. Yeah. Um, hmm. the, the new number, the new number two, didn't get uh, to my recollection. Didn't get any airplay at all. No, and they I, didn't. Th- and that was, I mean, that was th- those. Uh, I mean, those were a little further out. I, I would assume they were a little further out than what Danny's doing now. So, I mean, they were, you know, they were definitely a niche group i guess if you could call you could say so well they really have an electronic sound too very similar to what danny's doing here Mm -hmm. so you know i don't see this as that big a departure myself but then this is only one song i'm judging on did you see did either of you see the new number two live no no i did i saw them they were in san francisco and i saw them and i thought they were much better live than they were on record but that's you know so who knows? I, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if the recording from tonight or something from his live shows pops up somewhere. So, Incidentally, since yes. Alan, I, I know that, um, Alan, you heard the new song from Danny. Is there anything in there that sounds familiar to you? Um, I mean, the, the, the melodic contours are a little Georgy to me. Yeah. Um, I would expect, I would expect uh, that. Uh, yeah, but um, what do you have in mind, Ken? There is a song lyric. He actually used a lyric that was in Flying Hour mm. from mm-hmm. George. And I'm trying to remember if it's um, past it is gone and future may not be at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is a line really? there from Flying Hour, if you listen. It's said mm. one time. Listen carefully. <laughs> okay. I'll have okay. to go back and play it, but it, it's in there. Okay. Um, the only other thing I noticed in the news this week was there was a Jeff Emmerich interview in Variety, um, and his clip about talking about Sergeant Pepper has been wandering around the internet, but this also was an interview about Pepper, and um, while there's you know certain amount of what Jem- Jeff Emmerich says I take with a grain of salt, in this case, um, I was struck by the fact that he objected to a lot of the talk about the new Pepper release in terms of everyone saying that not as much time was spent on the stereo mix as the mono mix. And that's an argument that I made as well right here, I believe, and also in my mm-hmm. Beatle fan version of, 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 of the review, that, you know, first of all, we don't really know in terms of minutes how much time they spent. Um, but we can see from the listings in Lewison's book that they did, you know, either mix the stereo do the stereo mixes at the same time as the mono mixes, or in some cases they did them later. But in almost every case, there were multiple, multiple stereo mixes of each song. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I never really bought that idea of, you know, oh, they just tossed the stereo mixes off. And I was sort of happy to hear Jeff Emmerich say that because, Mm -hmm. you know, that's something I think he would remember. And, um, 
just adding that to the mix here. Um, if, if anyone's still pondering that stereo mono issue with Sergeant Pepper. That's interesting because, I mean, that, that gives a little more legitimacy to the stereo mixes, um, which I've always liked. I mean, but yeah, yeah so yeah. that's good. That's good to hear. Yeah, I saw that too. I saw that in the interview, and I immediately thought of you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so bootlegs. Um, let me say. No, wait, the... wait. I thought. I thought. I thought we were going to talk about Paul Setlist. Oh, yeah. Quickly. Okay. Remember. Okay. Okay, and finally, we thought we would um, have a brief um, Paul Setlist watch. In uh, you know, so long as he's on tour, and um, anything to report, guys. No, <laughs> nothing, not, nothing. Really, nothing. I mean, he's just all he's doing is um, he's changed the the second and fourth songs seem to be the basic the songs where he makes the changes, and all it's been is save us and letting go and Junior's Farm and Jet mm-hmm. uh, between the the four shows I have in my hand. Uh, in one show, he uh, did the uh, show at uh, at Omaha. He did throw in "Get Back" uh, instead of "Birthday," but other than that, he's not chain- making a whole lot of changes. Anyone looking for lots of changes are, is going to be very disappointed. Very disappointed. Yeah, I've been checking with every show, and um, yeah, it, it's not surprising me. I have a feeling that when he, after he has his break, and he starts playing in the Northeast in September, that hopefully there'll be some changes by then. But uh, most of the the coverage of this tour has been so positive in just the reviews. I mean, everybody is raving about his shows. And well, um, that, you isn't, know, that isn't all that surprising. I mean, I, they, they're always they're, the the newspaper stories I've seen have always been pretty positive because everybody is so floored by seeing him and seeing three hours worth of you know songs and and the fact that he's still doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I mean, and it is a good show. That you know, that's, that's you know, there's not a question there. But uh, it, yeah, I've seen the reviews too, and you know, everybody, you know, between going between Beatlemania and and everything else. I mean, yeah, the reviews have been very positive. Yeah, and and it should be. I mean, he's giving you the best that he can, and you couldn't ask for more. It's just the only thing that we really you know are being critical of is is, is the set list. And the right, is the same, and and, the, and well, yeah, and the voice, which is, I mean, which the reviews aren't really touching. The reviews aren't really talking about the voice. Mm. They're just saying how great the show is, which you know is fine. Even yeah. Bill King, I, I read his review, and he said, yeah, there were a couple of weak spots in his voice, but for the most part, the show was wonderful, just mm-hmm. the way it was. You know, so anyway, we're probably overly critical. Okay, so we got bootlegs to talk about. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Um, you know, and in fact, actually, a, a couple of things to say just in general about bootlegs. I mean, first of all, the bootleg world is a completely different place now than it was when it started in the late 60s, 1969 or so, when, you know, those first couple of get back bootlegs came out. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, now, you know, Paul shows pretty much as soon as he plays them. They're out there, you know. Um, Ringo shows a little bit less, but um, there is a, a huge representation of them too. Um, and this is the same for artists across the board. I mean, you know, Dylan too. Uh, you know, day or two after he plays a show, it's up there on the web somewhere. Having said that, um, we officially don't know where you can find these things um we don't sell them we don't give them away we don't know where you can find them so don't ask us because we couldn't tell you but you can learn to use google that's all i can say you know um um, because the other thing that's happened actually is the rise of desktop bootlegging now that everyone has a computer and you know sophisticated software less sophisticated software pretty much what people are doing or you know they're just making bootlegs themselves either they've gone to a show and taped it and put it right up on the net or you know there's a lot of um 
post-production going on. You know, a bootleg will come out or there will be, you know, 50 favorite bootlegs from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and people listen to them and say, you know, I can speed correct that. I can EQ that. I can make mm-hmm. that sound better. And so people are and, – and also the other thing people are do are is compiling. You know, there's – okay, we have – outtakes from say rubber soul scattered on 15 different bootlegs let's put them all together you know that kind right. of thing so you know there's there's an awful lot going on you can do it yourself if you you know have all these tracks and um often upgrades come around to any way so it's i don't know to me it's a really exciting world um there was a mm-hmm. very long time in which i listened to bootlegs much more than i listened to the commercial records because i'd already heard the commercial records eight gazillion times mm-hmm. um and bootlegs were something new and different and you know and i think the artists recognize it too i mean lest um you know universal come to me and say hey cozen what are you doing when i interviewed paul mccartney in 1990 probably we talked about bootlegs and he said he collects bootlegs and he tapes other people's concerts and he says in fact he doesn't mind a good bootleg if it's got you know some charisma and uh didn't he come yeah but didn't he walk that comment back at one point i mean after he said it I don't know because I think Nothing. I think somebody I think that got I think that got tossed back at him and he walked it back a little bit because he of what he'd said. What he said to me after that was, yeah, you know, now having said that, my lawyers always say to me, "Oh, yes, you do care about them." Right. Okay. And, and he and he said, uh, you know, when I ran into this guy on the street and 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 he said, you know, I, I I've heard from your lawyers, you know, have you, I thought you liked bootlegs and. And he said, yeah, but you got caught. So in a way, he's having it both ways. But we know that mm-hmm. personally he likes them. John liked them too. I mean, John was mm-hmm. John was on the radio um, talking about them. I mean, he right. you know, got his copy of Yellow Matter Custard from Dave Morrell as a, right. in, in, a, in an interesting trade where he gave Dell a butcher cover, Dave, Dave a butcher cover slip of, you know, the slick. And uh, and drew a picture on it and signed it to him um, in exchange for yellow matter custard. So you know, which was gee, not, that was that was not a that was a no brainer there. I think that was a good deal <laughs> for Dave. That was definitely that was definitely a good deal for Dave. Yeah, yeah. yeah he talked about that when he was with us uh, way yeah. back. But yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, so what we 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 decided to do was we would each pick five and we would mix it up solo and group and um, we're going to go around and I thought I'd start with Steve because I know he's probably chosen some of the same ones as me. <laughs> <laughs> but but we should say that we're picking our five favorites. Oh right, yeah. Not, not right. necessarily what we think are the best, and they could actually end up being the same. Yeah, for for some of us anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. So well, that's the thing. It's I, I find it really hard to pick favorites at this point because it, it you know there are so many of them out there and they keep mm-hmm. improving, and I have like several hundred favorites. <laughs> so, yeah, but I was yeah, uh, I, in my case, I was trying to pick something that would represent a broad array of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So they're favorites, but they're not necessarily, you know, they're not necessarily what I would take to a desert island. But um, why don't we start with Steve? Steve, okay. what were yours? All right, let me start with. Uh, I'm I'm rummaging through my pile here. Um, the first one I picked was. The um, Beatles get back, and there's a lot of versions of this, but this is the uh, master disc, two disc master disc version that has both the get back album and the rooftop concert, mm-hmm. plus a little book, plus a little booklet on the inside. It's the best sounding version of this that I've seen. I believe this is Japanese, but yeah, it's the best sounding one I've I'm aware of. So that's one. Uh, I'm gonna let's see. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna not go in any order here. I'm just gonna uh, because I do have solo and and group. Another of two John, John Lennon ones here. Listen to this radio show, which has the full Dennis Elsis interview, which is one of my favorite 
interviews of him when he's doing that, uh, you know, just rapping on the radio. I, I love that. I think that's fantastic. And then a two disc set of the full Lennon Rolling Stone interview, which as I recall, this was the first time it came out. Rolling Stone didn't put it out themselves until well after this came out. I believe, so this leaked, I believe that was a Darth disc, wasn't it? It may have been. It doesn't say Darth on it. Okay. But I believe, there was I, a uh, four four CD Darth disc version. It came in two volumes. You know. Right. This is that's what this is. Okay. That's this, this is, and yeah, it, it has two Rolling Stone covers for the artwork. Is that the oh, one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't aware we were doing interviews, including that, because all of mine are music. Okay. Well, I pick, I mean, I just picked my favorites, but mm-hmm. yeah, um, but those Darth disc guys are so cool. Yes, they are. <laughs> they definitely are. They definitely are. Another one is a is a next one is a well, like the the Lennon one is too, and uh, um, this is a, a a homegrown set. Not that I I mean I didn't do it. It was it was uh, traded around. It's called the songs we we were singing. It was a four disc set of of original songs that they had that, uh, of songs they had done. So the original of uh, uh, I'm looking at the back here. Um, Mailman, Bring Me No More Blues by Buddy Holly. What Am I Living For by Chuck Willis. I mean, there's a, there, there's a whole bunch of putting on the, the uh, original putting on the style by Lonnie Donegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dream Baby by Roy Orbison. So it's uh, there are others like this, too. And I'm, uh, there's another one that I have that I can't uh, remember the name of. Um, go there's, ahead. There's one that has way superseded that one called Dustbin Prophecies. Um, oh yes, and, oh uh, yeah. Dustbin Prophecies has like they have found like everything any of the Beatles covered or mentioned, I think, or you know, and they've got the right. originals of all of those things. So I think they they took the songs we were singing and sort of ran with the idea. I don't. Be- I think Dustbin Prophecies is pretty much an online only thing. I've never seen it discs of it. You know. Um, I wouldn't be well. I wouldn't be surprised if you can find it in Japan. But, yeah, probably. But uh, but yeah, I've never seen anything but uh, but it online. So am I gathering from these two boots songs we are singing in Dustbin Prophecies? He's also included songs that the Beatles didn't release, but they also did live. Yeah, like the songs that Mark Lewis right. mentioned in the exactly. Beatles Live. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I could run down to. They've got the uh, originals of the Decca covers, like Three Cool Cats, September in the Rain, Take Good Care of My Baby, Crying, Waiting, Hoping, Sheik of Araby. I mean, they're, they're, each of the discs uh, are different. So, And in fact, each of the. There's, this is a four disc set, and each of the four discs has pictures of each Beatle on. Well, the, yeah, a single Beatle on each, on each of the covers. Okay. That's a great uh, idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Let's see the last two. I'm gonna I'm gonna save the 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 my my favorite favorite for last. The the one I have to mention and the one that when we first started talking about this subject, I said I have to mention is the original ultra rare tra- uh, tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, those you can't say enough about those. I mean they they were redone in in many different versions. Um, John C. Wynn put a book out about the the Barrett tapes. There is a Barrett tape file with all the listings in it that you can find around. That's a very good research tool. But the ultra rare tracks uh, on swing on trademark quality, actually Swinging Pig, were uh, – I remember the uh, – when they came out, everybody was freaking out. I mean, they were just absolutely stunning. They were redone originally right around that time as Backtrack. Yeah. And put uh, – yeah. uh, but um, and then they were redone again and again and again. They were uh, there's been several versions of these things, but that's one that um, really spurred, you know, a lot of what has come out. It came out after it spurred the anthology because that came out before the anthology. And and I remember hearing at the time that that I believe it was George Harrison was furious that those things had leaked. Hmm. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. Speaking I think of what was stunning was the fact that it was board quality, right? <laughs> yeah, that was of all the stuff. And after years was, and years of hearing inferior quality material, which is fascinating in its own way, to hear it as perfect as you possibly can yeah. was just uh, you know it shocked a lot of people. Right. I mean, I think what we had had before that, the only thing we'd had before that of that kind of quality was the Deca tape. Um, and everything else was either 
concert recordings, which some of which were, you know, board recordings, but they had the audience all over them. And otherwise, BBC, which in a lot of cases, I think in most cases at that time, were from tapes people recorded off the air and right. uh, not always very well. So these things really were a revelation because they were studio outtakes in stereo, or I should say raw two track in, in mm -hmm. a lot of cases. And it took years for the whole batch to come out because, right. um, you know, the story behind it is really a relationship between John Barrett, who was an EMI engineer who when he was diagnosed with cancer, um, EMI, I guess, asked him what his dream job would be, and it was to catalog all the Beatles stuff. So it was his job to do that before Mark Lewison came along. He never finished. In fact, he didn't actually get that far. I mean, he, he wrote these lists of what was on tapes, but no real notes or analysis that, that I've seen anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so then they hired Mark to do that job. But he was pals with a DJ named Roger Scott. Both these guys are dead. So, um, you know, there's nothing – we're not pointing the international copyright police in anyone's direction because they'll never find them. Um, <laughs> but Roger Scott, um, in his professional capacity, was, was putting together Beatles-related radio shows and some – material he got from John Barrett actually got on those shows. You know, you listen to, there was one called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is a, like, how long was it? Like a nine or ten week series. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just in the middle of nowhere, you'll play, you know, We Can Work It Out, and it has a count in, and it <laughs> doesn't fade out. You know, it, a lot of mm. these things, you, you're sort of listening to the show, and suddenly, hey, that's that's a raw studio tape. And, uh, right. So Roger Scott had an awful lot of the John Barrett material. And after he died, um, a lot more of it began coming out. So uh, I think we have it all now. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, the, the other thing to mention is that at the time when these things came out, a lot of those tracks that were in stereo uh, on the bootlegs were in mono. Um, were not in were had not been released in stereo, so that was the you know that was the real what, what that you was mean? the real well I mean a lot of those early tracks were in stereo the um, the Beatles tracks right yeah so and they, and they weren't in stereo on the CDs oh on the uh, the official CDs but on the LPs right. you could, LP, right. you could get them and, yeah right um, right you know the great thing about them was um, they 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 showed how the tracks were made and they had the count-ins mm -hmm. and they had, you know, you could reconstruct how I saw her standing there was, was made, you know, with the edit of the count-in onto right. the finish track. And, and then you heard the clapping overdubs. It's, it's, it, it really was great stuff for anybody who is curious in a scholarly way about how the Beatles did what they did. And after get after, I mean, the sessions album pre the sessions bootleg album Ooh. preceded, this and you know after hearing that i mean that was that was uh, you know that was a big attraction that was very popular for a while i mean this was just fantastic and you and you get to hear some real changes in the development of the tracks like she's a woman for example mm -hmm. um and i'm looking through you is another one yeah so anyway um my final choice and i was going through the stuff and i was going Oh, I have to pull this one. Is George Harrison beware of Abco? Uh huh. I absolutely, absolutely, and I had not heard that until today. For I hadn't listened to it in several years, and I put it on today, and it was like, oh my god, what a beautiful disc that is, and uh, it's uh, that's something that uh, should be released. So remind our listeners what it covers. It covers – it's all acoustic. It's mostly acoustic, I should say, and covers the um, uh, All Things Must, must Pass sessions, uh, Run to the Mill, Art of Dying, Everybody, Nobody, Wah Wah, Window Window. And I remember – I was listening to, to it uh, before we started, and he talks about, well, this is a new song. It's called Beware of Darkness, and I need a few more words for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so – 
some of this stuff was in development. Some of it, most of it is acoustic. There are some tracks with electric guitar. There were uh, bootlegs uh, that came out of the All Things Must Pass sessions with alternate versions in excellent quality. But for my, you know, this this one's better as far as I'm concerned. Well, this was really meant to give to Phil Spector so that he would know the new material that George had written. Right. Right. And um, you had mentioned a few titles there, uh, Steve, like Window, Window. There were a handful of songs there that he didn't release at all. That's right. So right. it's nice to hear those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether or not you think they're as good as what turned up on All Things Must Pass, uh, I probably feel that they're inferior. Although there's one called Cosmic Empire that I think you could have worked on a little bit. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's that's it's actually one of my top five. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mine, yeah. mine too, in a different version. But yeah, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, well. okay. So Ken, what were your yes, five Alex. picks? <laughs> what were your five picks down there in Connecticut? <laughs> down there from oh, my this point. is this is strictly a Connecticut thing. Ah, okay. Nobody else feels this way except the people in Connecticut. People in okay. the nutmeg state. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, um, I'm not going to say that these are all in order, although what I what I rank at number one is my number one favorite bootleg. But um, just to give you an idea of what I personally find the most fascinating when it comes to bootlegs, there's nothing like an unreleased song. And then there's always, of course, alternate takes, different mixes, demos. They're all fascinating in their own way, but I always kind of though not always, rate unreleased songs as being the most important. Sometimes even a weak song that's unreleased can be more interesting than an alternate take that's not that much different than all the other takes that are out there. So for me, anything that has a lot of unreleased material in terms of actual songs that have never come out, those are the ones that I tend to gravitate to. Not saying that they're the best, but they're the ones that, that I return to the most and, and listen to the most. So at number five, I had to just group together all the Lost Lennon tape material because there is so much that they played in the radio show that I loved, especially all the unreleased songs. And there were, I don't know, maybe a half dozen to a dozen unreleased songs or songs that were prototypes that led to the finished songs. Mm -hmm. And I love listening to all that stuff. In particular, the songs that John wrote uh, for a proposed musical. So we've heard of the Ballad of John and Yoko. There are songs that were grouped in that late 70s, 1977 period. Sally and Billy. She was a friend of Dorothy's. Tennessee. Songs like those. Mm -hmm. You know, those songs I find fascinating, especially, well, Free as a Bird was, was that period too. Uh, Real Love. Yeah. was late 70s so all these songs that you hear it as demos or just john on the piano or just john on guitar and then you say to yourself could he have developed these songs more are these songs that had he lived he would have come back to or used parts of which he was known to do so um i find that whole thing fascinating and the lost linen tapes was the best thing to me that ever happened on the radio week by week there was always some surprise of something you never heard before, in addition to all the alternate takes mm -hmm. of John Sola material mm -hmm. and interview clips and different mixes of songs. So they put out a whole slew of bootlegs of the Lost Linen Tapes material without Elliot Mintz's voice, just the songs themselves. And I collected all the ones that were on vinyl and eventually some of them on CD. And I treasure those. Mm -hmm. You know, I always go back to them. You are speaking, of course, of the set on Bag Records, I believe, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And wouldn't you agree they're all? Absol yeah, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> and and um, I believe it was Volume 9 of the Bag Records set was the first time we got our hands on the whole run of Esher demos. Hmm. Mm. Okay. So it's that was... It's funny that. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, Okay. You did that on purpose. Alex. No, I, I really you didn't. Right into that. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, one of my other top five are the White Album demos. Mm -hmm. And um, I love them so much because they all fit so rather nicely together as one package. You, you get the feeling that they were all there at George's bungalow in Isher, Ken Fawns, and they all did it in one day together in the same room. You get that feeling about it. And what I love about 
this collection of songs is, well, first of all, even though many of the songs on the White Album were acoustic anyway, it's nice to have acoustic versions of songs that were primarily electric, like back in the USSR, for example. And then, in addition to the White Album songs, you also know that they had written songs that eventually turned up on Abbey Road, mm-hmm. like, like Me, Mr. Mustard, and Polythene and Pam. Mm-hmm. And then there are the songs that they released in their solo careers, mm-hmm. like Jealous Guy and, and uh, Junk, or Sing Along Junk, those songs. And then a song like Sarah Milk Sea mm-hmm. is in there, too. So whenever I, I think of those titles, as much as I know the release versions, I always bring it back to the demo. <laughs> Yeah, that it first came out in. And one particular favorite of mine happens to be a song that George released on his own, and that's Circles. Mm -hmm. And while I love, love the version that George put out on his own, the one that was the demo has a very different, moody, dark feel to it, because I think they use a harmonium or some kind of organ on that, and it gave it such a different feel from the version that George released. So I like this whole collection, presenting it all together as one. And as we discussed, as far as upcoming projects that the Beatles would put out and Universal would put out, it's a natural that the White Album should be next next year. And and I I can't see how they can avoid putting out the White Album demos. And we've talked about this before several times. And the five demos that they put on the anthology sounded so crystal clear. And those were from George's own collection, mm-hmm. whereas uh, the bootlegs that have come out, I think, were John's personal collection. Right. They were a mono cassette dub, basically, from George's tape, which is stereo. Yeah. Okay. So we really imagine. need George's. <laughs> <laughs> imagine if we got all those songs <laughs> yeah. in that kind of quality. That would be heaven. You know? It would be. The only thing... The only thing I found a problem with with these demos is that it sounded like, in many cases, they were trying to overdub what they had already recorded. Mm-hmm. And so, like, oh, blah, dio, blah, da, it's not in sync, mm-hmm. you know, the different takes vocally. Yeah. yeah. Of, uh, so, you know, that's the only problem I have with the White Arm demos, but I love them for that reason. Yeah. I love, you know, every aspect about those demos. So which um, which boot of those do you prefer or are you you going with the one in the lost Lennon tape set i think it was the yellow dog one Mm -hmm. okay and the quality is not all that great throughout the whole thing but it's still fascinating to listen to yeah okay um also as steve had said beware of abco for the very same reasons that steve gave great material all things must pass material and in fact um some of it actually became available commercially because Let It Down Mm -hmm. uh, was put on the remaster for All Things Must Pass. I think Beware of Darkness was, too. I mean, that version of it. But there's nothing quite like John, Paul, or George with an acoustic guitar alone in perfect sound quality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've said it before, I just love the sound of George on an acoustic guitar. And sometimes, and especially in the case of All Things Must Pass, where, and, and I love Phil Spector's production, despite the fact that a lot of people are anti-Spector these days. Even George himself felt, you know, later on, shortly before he died, that he felt that it was maybe a bit overdone. There's such a drastic difference when you just hear George in an acoustic guitar compared to what came out on All Things Must Pass. But I love the contrast there of the two. They're just great on their own. Just as you can say that with the White Album demos. Mm -hmm. Also, my number two is Pizza and Fairy Tales. Oh, this wow. This a uh, double disc of uh, material from Paul, which was uh, well, about one CD was about out- outtakes of press-to-play material. And then it was more songs from that period. Yeah. The period in between press-to-play and Flowers in the Dirt when he was working with Phil Ramone. Mm-hmm. And some of those songs eventually trickled out commercially. The This One Demo. The This One Demo that Paul just put on his website Mm -hmm. as an exclusive download is from that. Right. It was originally on that. But there's a lot of songs from that period that I love so much, especially Return to Pepperland, which (laughs) I think think should have been released for the 20th anniversary at that time of Sgt. Pepper. I think that's got such a great hook to it. Once I have that song in my head, I can't get it out. Although Alan seems to think he interprets that differently than I do. 
<laughs> when you have a song stuck in your head. Well, if it's a good one, if it's a good one, Ken. <laughs> well, you know, I still think that if you have a song stuck in your head, you have to like it. Hmm. But anyway, I love Return to Pe- Pepperland. So many songs from that period came out as bonus tracks on the, the Flaming Pie CD singles. Uh, one particular song called Love Mix, which is another really catchy song. A lot of his danceable stuff, Atlantic Ocean, was from that time period, Love Come Tumbling Down. A lot of those songs, and I like hearing them all in one collection. There was a lot of material that he did not release. And part of the fun in listening to all these bootlegs is, whether it's Beatles or Solo, you might say to yourself, why didn't they put this out? This was good enough to come out as it was. And... um, you know, Once Upon a Long Ago was actually from that period anyway. Mm-hmm. Loveliest Thing was from that period. Mm-hmm. The original Beautiful Night, which we talked about in our last show, mm-hmm. which actually had some members of Billy Joel's band, Liberty DeVito, playing drums on it. That's on there. So I love that whole collection. And I like all the, the alternate takes of songs from Press to Play as well. So um, there's just so much material being a, a two-CD set that I had to include that one. Uh, in my top five. And my number one bootleg of all the bootlegs out there has got to be Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts to me, you know, we heard so much about Paul proposing this album of unreleased songs and B-sides, and there are different versions that have come out through the years of Cold Cuts. But I, I, um, I remember getting the first one, sticking mainly to that one, and um, because of the fact that there were 12 songs on there, and all of those songs at that time, I believe, had not been released at all, although we'd heard My Carnival on bootleg before that, though not in the same quality. And I believe we also, yes, we heard Water Spout, too, on yeah. a bootleg called Suitable for Framing, although it wasn't the full version of Water Spout, which was an unreleased song from London Town. All these songs, to me, are worthy of release. I'm not saying that they're all worthy of being on albums. Maybe some of them were B-sides. There was a live recording of a song called Best Friend, Mm -hmm. which dates back to 1972 when Paul played Europe with Wings. Eh, I like the song. It's not the greatest live song I think Paul's ever done, but it it could be a B-side. All this stuff really was worthy of coming out. Water Spout, I know so many people, when they heard Water Spout, said, why on earth? Didn't he put that on London Town? Same thing with A Love For You, which um, was from the Ram Sessions. Mm -hmm. And eventually he put that out on the the remastered Ram. And um, some of the songs have have been released on CD singles, like Mama's Little Girl and Same Time Next Year. But um, it's a lot of revelations on this entire album. And uh, Cage is another favorite. Comes from the Back to the Egg Sessions. Really catchy song that that could have fit nicely on that album. And, um, you know, sometimes it's fun to listen to all this unreleased stuff and try to understand, if it's at all possible, why the Beatles or any of them individually chose not to release this. And in the case of Paul, there's so much unreleased stuff. Yeah. And I'm sure so many people who who listen to this show would question why on earth he didn't put out some of these songs Mm -hmm. legitimately. And they probably will turn up on later remasters. I can't imagine London Town coming out with that water spout, for example. Mm-hmm. But And you keep hearing rumors that he's going to put out a box set of unreleased stuff. I don't know if that'll ever happen. I think he's saving it all for the remasters. But if you don't want to wait for the remasters and you still want to dig and try and find stuff he hasn't released, Cold Cuts is one that you know is an excellent start because it really represents... A lot of unreleased music throughout the 70s from him. Okay, so there are a billion different pressings of Cold Cuts and several different, actually, originals of Cold Cuts that McCartney compiled. So which are you recommending? Well, the first one. I think I only got a what? second or two or three of them. What label, but in you're... other words? Okay, let me get my CD out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I don't remember the labels, but um, what does it say here? Peg Boy. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I should mention the song Tragedy, mm-hmm. one of my favorite unreleased McCartney songs, which dates back to the Red Rose Speedway sessions. But it's it's a cover 
of the Thomas Wayne hit, and the Fleetwoods also had a hit with it. He did a fantastic job. I love the whole arrangement of Tragedy, especially using a sitar on that song. That's another one. I hear that, and I say, why didn't it come out on Red Rose Speedway? Mm-hmm. You know, so probably will be on the remaster for Red Rose Speedway, I would think. Right. But we'll see. But those are my top five. Well, as we know, Red Rose Speedway was originally going to be a double album. They actually did acetates of the whole thing, and EMI wanted it to be a single album. So right. lots of outtakes from that um, because of mm-hmm. that. Sure. So, okay, that is a good bunch of stuff. That makes it my turn, right? Are you done? Yep. Okay. Okay, okay so my turn. And I might as well start with Ringo since he has gotten no love tonight. <laughs> might as well give Ringo some respect by choosing at least one of his. And there were, there were several that I was juggling. One of them was the Memphis unreleased album, um, which is about uh, you know half of a CD of – uh, the Chips Moment production from 1987. And then there is the original Can't Fight Lightning, which, you know, more or less became Stop and Smell the Roses. But I decided instead to go with a, a general compilation of all kinds of different stuff called Riz Off. Weird title. A lot of Ringo bootlegs have weird titles. And Riz Off has, I mean, it's its really a hodgepodge, but it's a great hodgepodge. Um, it includes everything from a bunch of his Sun Country wine cooler ads to lots of TV show appearances. Um, uh, when he appeared on Saturday Night Live and did a medley with Billy Crystal, who was playing Sammy Davis Jr., um, that is on here. Uh, and it's it's pretty funny, and it sort of brought back to mind that whole appearance of his, which I, I thought was great. That was on, I would say, what, 1985 or so? 84, Around 85, that. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some studio outtakes, like um, there's a five-minute version of Dead Giveaway with uh, Ringo and Ron Wood. Uh, the one on Can't Fight Lightning is only three minutes something or other, you know, 3.49. There are two demos of Goodnight Vienna with Ringo and John. There's some uh, Honey Don't and Matchbox from uh, the Carl Perkins special. And, um, yeah, all, oh, oh, Scylla Black and Ringo singing Act Naturally on BBC. So, um, yeah, a couple, a couple of alternate versions of It Don't Come Easy, an alternate version of Six O'Clock. Uh, so there's really a lot of really good stuff on here, and it, it jumps back and forth from period to period. But um, I, I, I find it a very, um, as, as Paul said when we, was, we were talking about Bootleg's charismatic compilation. <laughs> so that's Ringo. For George, I can probably save us a little time because I'm also pretty much going with Beware of Apco, but I'm using a different version. I'm using the version that came out on a label called Silent Seas. Now, Silent Seas is one of the many labels that sort of basically repackages things that have been bootlegged elsewhere, but does it in either an expanded or, you know, more chronologically suitable way. And, you know, so they've done sets of all the Beatles outtakes and lots of live stuff and everything. They did one called Let It Down. Let It Down, and the first part of it is basically the demo tape that we were discussing just before uh, when we talked about Beware of Abco. So this version, Let It Down, also goes on to include a basically an acoustic jam with Phil Spector and George. I think Phil Spector is doing a lot of the singing, um, but they they run through all kinds of stuff. Save the Last Dance for Me, You Better Move On, Down in the Valley, Let, Baby Let's Play House, Bluebirds Over the Mountain, Smokey Joe's Cafe Leaning on Lamppost. Um, and it's, you know, that isn't the most stellar listening, but it's kind of fun. Uh, main, the main thing here is the... Uh, the bunch of demos, um, which, as you guys said, are really just brilliant and should be released. So that's George. Paul. Paul, I have a little problem because my first choice was Pizza and Fairy Tales. Um, ah, sorry. <laughs> and I have, sorry. 
And I thought when Ken was talking about pizza and fairy tales, I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll just do cold cuts instead. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but that's not going to work either. Having said that, there are many, many different versions of cold cuts. I mean, McCartney himself prepared three versions of it when he was considering releasing it. Um, one in 78, one in 80, and then one in, I think, about 86 or 87. And then the next thing we heard about it was in 1989 when he did his press conference at the Lyceum Theater in New York and someone asked about unreleased stuff and he said, well, I made this album called Cold Cuts, but all the, you know, it's been bootlegged so much that I'm not going to put it out. <laughs> but there is uh, there are a number of bootlegs of this, including one on Secret Garden, which I believe is another name that Silent Seas goes under. And they put on the 1978 version, the 1980 version, what they call the mid-80s version, which is 86 or 87. And then they have an extra version. And basically, one of the great things about this version of Cold Cuts is that they annotate every track. You know, they say, you know, where it's from, what mix it is. And the thing is that you know, McCartney's running order on Cold Cuts was pretty similar for the three versions, but he kept going back and remixing or adding a new vocal or adding a new something else, um, you know, for uh, for this book that will eventually be coming out, although not, not the first vo volume, of course, um, we talked to... Uh, Richard Niles, who was an arranger uh, who Paul McCartney used, and he did some arranging for Love For You. So that was in the mid-80s, I believe, and uh, so the earlier versions are different than the one he did. And uh, a lot of these tracks have changed a lot over the years, and the Secret Garden version kind of, you know, brings them all together. You can compare each one to the next one and the next one for four different versions. So, Ken, that's the one for you. Okay. <laughs> I, I will definitely look into that. Okay. You know, it gets confusing, all these different mixes. You know? It really does. So for John, um, I'm pretty much of the same mind as Ken, too, but I have a specific project that I'm thinking of or t two versions of this specific project. One was called Between the Lines, it is a nine CD set and one DVD of all of the demos, all of the home demos that John recorded between 1975 and 1980. So it has all those songs that Ken mentioned, and a, and a lot of them were sourced from the Lost Lennon Tapes discs. And other things have gotten out various ways. But there is another version which I got but have not yet been able to spend any time with, which is a set called Complete Home Demo Recordings 1975 to 1980 on the Mr. Claudel label, and that is 10 discs. So, wow. And I noticed that there were a couple of takes of, uh, of certain things, like, for instance, they're in different orders, so it's hard to find them, but I found that, that one seemed to have one or two extra takes of certain songs that weren't on the uh, Between the Lines version. So, you know, Mr. Claudel is another one of those labels that sort of repackages things that have been out elsewhere. And, um, you know, basically there are very few labels these days that put out brand new stuff. Basically HMC, which also goes under the name trademark of quality is a, a, a age old bootleg name, but it's different people um, mm -hmm. is, is doing a lot of stuff that hasn't been out before. Mr. Claudel kind of then picks those things up shortly after either, you know, HMC or, or someone else puts them out and, and recompiles them. Um, and sometimes they do a really good job. A lot of people are down on Mr. Claudel for, you know, for that reason. But, you know, they put them in, in order. They often sound quite good. And, uh, and they have this slightly expanded version of these Lennon home demos. So um, I'm just mentioning those. I haven't heard them yet. Mm. Okay, and my number one choice is the 
latest version of the many versions of the Beatles BBC recordings called BBC, the BBC Archives. It was put together by someone who goes under the name of Lord Reith, who is mm-hmm. a historical name from the BBC uh, history and is not the actual Lord Reith, who I believe is long, long dead. But this version took, you know, there have been many iterations of the BBC recordings on Pyramid, on Great Dane. Great Dane was the first really great set, uh, you know, of them. Mm -hmm. And and then Purple Chick did them with some stuff that wasn't on Great Dane, and uh, Yellow Dogs had a version. Basically, Lord Reith has taken all of the best of those, found the best quality, got some stuff that hadn't been bootlegged before, all told the audio version, and I think there was a, a DVD that came with this set too, the audio version is 24 discs worth of BBC stuff. Uh, on, <laughs> on my playlist, that is 935 tracks. Now... A lot of that is, I mean, he did separate, you know, if Brian Matthews talking, so the Brian Matthew introduction is a track, and then the Beatles performance is a track. And there are some shows where he had the whole show, uh, including some other performers, and so they're on too, although there's not that much of that on this version of the set. There's a little. But, you know, it's it's great quality it's the fullest version of these things that we have and the best quality versions and uh like this is the set to have if you want the bbc material and this is the set that emi or universal should just put out stop putting out little two disc compilations they're really nice but just do the real job, you know? Um, I mean, in a lot of cases, I, I compared some of these with the things that, that Universal put out. And in some cases, the intros are edited. So you're, okay, it's an intro and it may not matter, but you're really not getting the full sense of what was said and what was heard by the original audience. You're getting a, a sort of truncated version. And so, you know, this sort of leads me to another another point about bootlegs is that bootleggers are interested in it. I mean, there are all kinds of bootleggers and they have different philosophies, but generally speaking, the best of them are interested in putting out exactly what it is, what it was, how it was recorded in the best quality, whereas an official label is more interested in a, a sort of artistic production. And if they think that this introduction is four words too long. They'll cut out the four words. I just soon hear it as it happens, you know? Right. So that's, that's what you find on the BBC archive set from Lord Reith. Well, the they should guys? probably release both versions because <laughs> that the first live at the BBC double disc was tremendous the way it was, mm-hmm. the way that they packaged all the songs together. And for me, the biggest attraction with the BBC material are all the songs that they covered that they didn't release, right. plus I'll Be On My Way. And you had most of them on that first compilation. Right. So for people, there may be a lot of Beatles fans out there that love them, but don't want to hear every single, you know, every song, every version of it, and all the dialogue in between. Right. These um, people should be so... re-educated. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, well, and I, also the other thing about this is that it's everything chronologically. Like there are some shows we're missing, but basically they start with, uh, you know, Dream Baby. Actually, they start with the news report from that broadcast and the introduction huh. of Dream Baby, which is the first thing they played on the BBC. And they go chronologically right through every show. And and that, too, it shows you a development, and it shows you how far into their recording career they were still going on the BBC and playing these tracks that they were not recording for EMI, you know, those, those mm. old covers, you know, in many different versions that are, you know, not carbon copies of each other. And some of them are live shows with an audience in the BBC studios, so you, you hear mm-hmm. some clapping, but it's you know not like crazy like in the concerts. So yeah, but go again. Yeah, it's fascinating to me in particular that they did a song like "I Forgot to Remember to Forget," mm-hmm. and that was in 1964. Right. You know, and they hadn't released that 
on their own albums. Right. And that was fairly late in the game there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they could have easily have just plugged their own records at that point, but they still were giving the BBC material that they hadn't released. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 sort of like an extraordinary alternate career of the Beatles. I mean, all the hits are there, up to 65 anyway, but there's this whole bunch of extra stuff that, you know, they just never released, I mean, until the compilations came out. Um, yeah, the compilations are great. I mean, I, I, they're, they're fine. They're a lot of fun. But, um, but, but this is, uh, like, this is really the, the real thing. And for me, it's what I picked as a fave, but, you know, there's ultra rare tracks and all those others. Uh, you know, so many of the live recordings, Hollywood Bowl, original recordings, the, the Shea Stadium concert with, you know, the actual soundtrack of what was recorded. Mm -hmm. Um, there's there's so much great stuff out there, and uh, so you know we've chosen our five each, and there's enough for us to do another show one day, maybe next year. We'd be happy to hear what everybody has to say if you want to write us in and tell us what your faves are. And uh, I have one quick question. Sure. Um, since we mentioned ultra rare tracks, and we were talking about the fact that it was the first time that we had this kind of board quality. And many takes of the same song. Mm-hmm. No one has mentioned sessions. No, I did actually. I, you I did? yeah, I did when we were talking when uh, near the end there. I kind of snuck it in, but yeah, no, that was uh, that was quite a interesting little album. I played that thing to death. I loved it. I you loved know what? It. You know, I had been commissioned to write liner notes for that. You know, really? That? Yeah. So. You know, maybe we should do a show on Sessions one of these days, although everything on it came out on the anthology, basically. Right, Um, right. But I had been commissioned to write a set of liner notes, and it ended up being sort of a turf war between British EMI and Capital, and Britain wanted Brian Suthel to write them. There are Mm. notes signed by Brian Suthel on the original bootleg, but he claims that they have nothing to do with, with his notes. Uh, but the upside was that in the transaction, I said to their representative, who was a guy named John Carter, uh, who was originally in the Strawberry Alarm Clock, but he was the American delegate to the International Beatles Committee. And he came to New York, and we were going to meet and talk about these notes. And I said, well, you know, you really have to give me a copy of this if I'm going to write the notes. And he took out a very fancy metal cassette and said, okay, here you go. You can copy it. And my setup had a cassette player and an open reel. So I threaded up an open reel and he said, oh, come on, at least have the decency to copy it to cassette. And I said, well, as you see, there's one cassette player. And he said, well, okay. So I got a copy. The version he played me was a little bit different than the one that was bootlegged. Because at that point, it was not yet, I don't think it was, I'm not sure if it was called Sessions yet. It originally was going to be called Beatles Boots. Really? They were going to have the four boots, you know, on the cover. And then they thought, well, that's not a good message to send. So then they were going to call it um, one, two, three, four. (laughs) There are no count-ins to any songs on that record. (laughs) But they were going to call it one, two, three, four, and uh, someone wisely argued that that's not good either, so it became Sessions. Um, and the version he played that was a little bit different. Um, I, I'm not sure the bootlegged version had the Christmas Time is Here Again on the beginning and end. That was one thing mine had, um, because it was supposed to come out around Christmas originally. And I basically argue, are you, are you telling me that you're you're putting those on here just because this is going to come around Christmas? I mean, you should just put the whole track as a separate track in there, which they didn't do. But I think they then took the Christmas bits off. And yeah, it was it was a very weird time. Uh, you know, and then finally, finally, they ended up not putting it out at all, as you know. I mean, it became uh, it became a football in that uh, Beatles versus EMI lawsuit that wasn't settled until 1989. And then when it was settled, there was no point in putting out sessions because they were already talking about 
doing what became the <laughs> anthology. Mm-hmm. So but that was pretty important for its time. It really was. Who oh was, yeah. Who is the? Who is the? Um, who killed it though? It was the Beatles that killed it, right? Yeah, yeah. Basically, the the Beatles argued that EMI didn't have the right to put out any unreleased stuff, and EMI argued that yes, indeed, we do have the right to put out unreleased stuff. But it became a bargaining chip, and that uh. is that is why in the 1989 agreement, one of the provisions was that EMI could not put out anything without the approval. Of Apple, and that included not just unreleased stuff, but even compilations like love songs. The the only thing they initially agreed to allowing out were the red and blue compilations, but no love songs, no rock and roll music, no Hollywood wow. Bowl even uh, originally. And so you know they've revisited things over the years, obviously, uh, just why we have Hollywood Bowl now, but. Um, but that was the agreement at the time. Wow. So, so I, I, wait, should, wait. I should hasten to say that my tape did not become the bootleg of Sessions. Well, uh, one other question then is your tape – I assume that your tape is better quality than the bootleg, right? Um, could be. <laughs> but it's, irre- but okay. it's irrelevant now because those things are all on, on anthology. That's true. So. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. So well, it was exciting we, at the moment because yeah. you know got to hear "Leave My Kitten Alone" and oh, those yeah. songs. And oh yeah, that means a lot. Although, well, yeah, the got trouble. Yeah, the I'd heard those kinda... before. I'd heard those before anyway because of um, there was a bootleg called what was it called, Steve? There was a bootleg. Oh, 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 I know the one you're talking about, and I can't think of it. Off file the top under. Of my head. File under. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And if you recall, in nineteen in the summer of nineteen eighty four, Scott Muni somehow got his hands on a really good quality of Leave My Kitten Alone and played it on any WFM a number of times before they stopped him. Mm. Hmm. Anyway. That also reminds me that um that uh, KFRC here in, in San Francisco played How Do You Do It several times. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what year it was, but I do remember them playing it because I remember driving around to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was determined to. I was I think I was still living at home then, and the only way I was going to hear it was in my car. So I right. drove I drove around. Well, that was you know that was released on bootleg in the early seventies, around the same time as the Decagon singles that were the Deca audition tape. Uh-huh. Recordings, um, so that was around. NEW played that once in I think 1972 when they had a Beatles A to Z, and they got up to H, and there was "How Do You Do It," and I said, "What? Mm. Whoa! I don't have that. I have to get that." <laughs> <laughs> and how a bootleg collector was born. <laughs> oh, it started that was, with that one song. No, not really. It started. With, uh, <laughs> it probably sounds- started. It probably started when um, Dave Morell went on to uh, uh, Howard Smith's show after one of the John Lennon interviews and brought along Yellow Matter Custard and um, probably what was called Whiskey Flats at the time, and you know, and played a bunch of these things. And I thought, wow, okay, those things are out there. Got to have them. Mhm. Oh, I remember. I remember where I used to see them. Uh, there was a a place uh, in downtown San Jose that I used to be able to walk to from San Jose State. That uh, people in the area will know. Um, I won't mention the name of the the show. It's I mean the shop. It's long gone now, but uh, they had them sitting right on the rack, right uh, facing the street. Mm-hmm. There, and I remember seeing the BBC. I remember seeing Yellow Matter Custard there. Wow. Way back, that was that was the beginning. Okay, so that was um, that was a lot of fun going through some of those things that are you know semi illicit, actually from the record industry's point of view, totally illicit, but you know really great stuff that tells us a lot about the Beatles and are also just a lot of fun to listen to. So, I think if you want to contact us um we can be reached at things we said today radio show at gmail.com um we've been getting an increasing amount of mail and we answer it when we can and uh feel free to comment or uh 
suggest things or argue things, whatever you want to do. You can also find us on Twitter at, at Things We Said Fab. And we have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And we can be reached individually as well. I can be reached on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And Steve, how about you? I can be reached on uh, my personal page. And I also have a Beatles group called Beatles News and Information. And my email is BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. Okay, and Ken, you have um, undoubtedly some contests and things coming up this week on your your own page and show? Well, on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, I have my weekly Beatles trivia, and every single week you can win one of nine uh, great prizes, like CDs, DVDs, and books. That's every week. That goes without saying. But I do want to say that um, last week I had the pleasure of interviewing Brian Ray, for about an hour discussing uh, his work with Paul McCartney. Brian has been in Paul's touring band since 2002, playing guitar and bass. So we talk about that. We talk about being on Paul's studio albums. Uh, We also talk about his relatively new album from his band called The Bayonets. Mm -hmm. And it really is a terrific album. We've talked about this before. It's it's got great rock and roll on it, strong R&B, lots of great guitar hooks. Um, We talk about that. And um, there's quite a bit about Brian working with McCartney on there. So if you can, it's on the interviews page four page. If you go to the tab that says more interviews, you go to the drop down menu, look for interviews page four, and it's the interview right at the top of the page. Brand new interview with Brian Ray. And if you want to email me, my uh, address is everylittlething at att.net. Okay, and if you are just interested in the history of bootlegs generally, not particularly the Beatles, uh, in fact, the Beatles aren't really that well covered in it, there is a book called Bootleg by Clinton Halen that is a fairly interesting read, and uh, he interviews a lot of the early bootleggers and, uh, and, and, and sets the history pretty straight. So there's that. So, thanks for joining us, and for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci, I'm Alan Cozen, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.